and do it in a meaningful way. I see my colleague from Maryland is here, and I, uh, at this point, yield the floor. President. Senator from Maryland. Mr. President, um, I come to the floor today to really talk about the crisis uh, that America is facing. And we really are facing two crises. We're facing a significant debt crisis, uh, and we are facing a significant political leadership crisis. We need to deal with both, and we need to be sure that all things are on the table and all people are at the table trying to find sensible, pragmatic solutions to be able to move our country forward and stabilize our economy so that we can grow our economy. Now, I'm going to talk first about the debt crisis, then I'm going to talk about what we need to do to act like Americans. Mr. President, I'm for a more frugal government, and we have been voting on cuts in discretionary spending. I supported the ban on discretionary spending earmarks. You were a reformer in that area. I joined with you in that area. I also voted for 41 billion cuts in the continuing resolution. In April, I voted for 78 more billion in cuts. I wanted to avoid a Tea Party shutdown and work for this more frugal government. But now we have to lift the debt ceiling and in order to do that, have a path forward on dealing with both deficit and debt. But in order to do that, we need to, just as we cut the earmarks on discretionary spending, we've got to cut the tax break earmarks. Those tax break earmarks that have gone to the well-connected, but who are disconnected from how we can help our economy grow. I never thought a budget deal would be easy, but I thought we could agree on a few key principles. Well, we have it. The Republicans want to close Social Security offices. I want to close tax leave loopholes. They want to get rid of teachers. I want to get rid of sacred cows. And that's why I voted last week to end the tax break on ethanol production. Wow. Talk about a tax break earmark, it is an ethanol. And it has serious consequences to our budget. It's also artificially raised the cost of corn. And so what does that mean to Barb Mikulski? Well, right now, what are the most important industries on my eastern shore is poultry. Poultry has helped make Maryland great and provided jobs for thousands of Marylanders, people who work hard, get dirt under their fingernails, salute the flag. Well, they want us to act like we salute the flag and work under the flag. Corn is now $7 a bushel. I've got companies that have been around for over 100 years filing bankruptcy. Well, I can't allow that to go on. We've got to get rid of the artificial subsidies and deal with this and use that money to go into deficit reduction. So I want part of any agreement that we make to make sure that ethanol is eliminating the tax ear break earmark on ethanol to also be in the budget. I also want to get rid of oil and tax, uh, oil and gas tax breaks. Gas has reached, in many parts of my state, $4 a gallon. Yet at the same time, the five biggest oil companies made $36 billion in profits in the first three months. Three months they made $36 billion. Well, companies making billions in profits should again pay their fair share. We Democrats voted to end those subsidies and devote $2 billion a year to deficit reduction. Now, the Republicans want to keep tax break earmarks. I want to get rid of tax break earmarks. But they refuse to end these giveaways. There are <clears throat> Senator Durbin spoke eloquently about the tax breaks to send jobs overseas. Those jobs have left. They went on a slow boat to China, a fast track to 
fast track to Mexico. Other jobs are in dial 100 anywhere but in the USA. We've got to have a patriotic tax code where we crack down on the tax cheats and invest the money back here at home. And it's not only the tax cheats, we legally give them money. We take the money of people who worked in manufacturing, who paid taxes, and when they paid those taxes, we give subsidies to send their jobs overseas. Wow. No wonder people are mad at Congress. They ought to be mad at Congress. But I worry about the consequence also of default. You know, Mr. President, when I go around Maryland, they don't understand what this means. They think when we raise the debt ceiling that it's going to raise their interest rates on like their credit card, their student loan, their mortgage in some way if they have a variable rate. Oh my gosh, it's just really something. We need to really make in plain English what this means. The fact that the United States of America might not pay its bills on August 3rd. This is frightening. It's frightening from the standpoint of national honor. <clears throat> America should pay its bills. It's always paid its bills. And also it's important from our economy. The consequences could be draconian, unprecedented, even well beyond the Armageddon of the Great Depression. We could on August 3rd not be able to pay our Social Security benefits. We could not be able to pay our veterans' benefits. This is shocking. We can't allow this to happen. So we've got to come to the table. That's why I said at the opening of my remarks, we all have to be at the table, and all things have to be on the table. Now I'm going to talk about political leadership. I want to talk about all of us at the table. I lived through a very serious crisis when Ronald Reagan was president. And Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Meal, and Howard Baker provided the political leadership. It was tough, and it was scary. In 1982, we were scared that we could not meet our obligations, that our Social Security checks would go out. The trust fund was running on fumes. America faced the fact that we would go into default with our senior citizens. President Reagan provided leadership. I didn't agree with everything President Reagan uh, wanted to offer, but he said we have to put America first. He called up his friend Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill brought Democrats to the table, and Bob Berg was our leader in the House. Those two men stood together as Americans, not as Democrats. Turned to Bob Dole, chairing the Finance Committee, and Howard Baker. They came to the table, not as Republicans, but as Americans. That's what we need now. We have to come to the table as Americans. I love being a Democrat. My family were Democrats. We're going to be Democrats forever. But what I love more is being an American. I got into politics as a protester. In other countries, they would have thrown me in prison. Here they put me into politics to stand up for the people. I would not have been able to go to college. I would not have been able to pursue the American dream. I love America, and I want America to have a great future ahead of it. We have to stop acting like, are we the red party and the blue party? We've got to start acting like we are the red, white, and blue party. Now, I've heard about these pledges to uh, Grover Norquest, but I take one pledge. I take a pledge to the flag of the United States of America, one nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice, 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 justice for all. That's what we need to do. I take an oath, too. It's on the Constitution to protect and defend the people and the law that governs it. Now, let's get real here, and let's realize who our first pledge is to. So I say to my colleagues, on both sides of the aisle. Go back to your Republican history books. Read what Ronald Reagan did in 1982. Read what Republican leadership did in 1982. I will do the same for Democrats. When Tip O'Neill brought us to the table, I had to make tough votes. We took great strong medicine, but you know what, at the end of the day, we made our obligations. Seniors got their checks, 
We got the Social Security Trust Fund in the, there, and out of that crisis became a stronger economy and a better America. We can do it, but let's realize who we take our pledge to, and mine will always be, not to the Democratic Party, but to the United States of America. So let's be at the table and put all things on the table. Uh, Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. is recognized. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I rise for a moment during this time of going business to talk about think, what everybody's talking about. That's the crisis with our debt ceiling, the approaching the deadline that we have and what we should do. Last night as I thought about what I would say this morning, I thought back to that horrible month of September and October of 2008 when the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression hit the United States of America. I was a member of the Senate, and I was here the night the TARP boat came before us to try and salvage and save the financial system of the United States. Probably the toughest vote I ever took. As time has proven, it was the right vote to take because we did stabilize the financial system. But at that time, we were reacting to a crisis that we were not in control of. Today, we have a crisis that we are totally in control of. It's ironic to me that 30 days or 35 days before the deadline of August 2nd, we're fiddling around in the Senate arguing with each other so we should be talking to each other, looking at those things that we can do to avert a crisis and to move forward. I see my leaders come to the floor, so I'm going to shorten my remarks a little bit so he can have his full time. But I do want to make this point. This is a crisis in which we are in control, unlike 2008. We can make a difference. And the balanced budget amendment that's been proposed by the Republican Conference of this Senate is the straitjacket and the discipline we all need. When I was a state legislator for 17 years, we had a program in terms of drug abuse called Just Say No, where you just said no to drugs and we taught kids not to use them. Well, we need a way for the Congress to say just say no to spending. We need the straitjacket and the discipline to have a constitutional restriction on our ability to have runaway spending without any accountability. It's the type of discipline almost every state in the United States imposes upon itself. In Georgia, we can't deficit spend because our Constitution won't let us. We can't borrow more than 10 percent of our uh, entire budget because the Constitution will not let us. Those are the types of disciplines the United States Congress needs. So I end before I yield to the leader with, with the way I've begun. When the financial crisis hit in September 2008, we were dealing with issues upon which we had no control. 
Today we are dealing with an issue upon which we have total control. It's time we put in the straitjacket, the procedures, and the process to balance the budget of the United States of America and run our country like every American family has to run their budget. And now I'll yield the floor to the leader. Mr. President, Republican leader. I'd like to say a word about the President's press conference yesterday. What I heard him propose is that we solve the debt crisis by spending more money. Solve the debt crisis by spending more money. And that we solve a jobs crisis by raising taxes. Solve a jobs crisis by raising taxes. I want to know. Is there a single member of Congress, Democrat or Republican, who thinks it's a good idea to raise hundreds of billions of dollars in new job-killing taxes at a time when 14 million Americans are out of work? I haven't heard from any of them, but that's what the President was trying to defend yesterday. Who really thinks the answer to a $1.6 trillion deficit is a second stimulus, that the answer is more deficit spending. Where in the world did that idea come from? That's what the President was trying to defend yesterday. Look, the President needs to get serious about this. He said yesterday that reducing the deficit grows the economy. That part of his press conference he got right. Reducing the deficit grows the economy. His own Small Business Administration has told him not to enact one of the tax hikes he was now proposing at the press conference yesterday. This is what they said over at the SBA. It could force many small businesses to close, close their doors. Fourteen million people out of work, and he wants to take an action that would force small businesses across the country to close? That's his vision of shared sacrifice? I think the American worker has sacrificed quite enough already. Besides, all of us know that Congress isn't going to approve hundreds of billions of dollars in tax hikes. It's simply not going to happen. We've known that for six months, and we've been saying it all along. The President does not seem to get it. So let me do something that I think would be constructive. I'd like to invite the President to come to the Capitol today to meet with Senate Republicans. Anytime this afternoon he's available to come on up to the Capitol and meet with Senate Republicans. That way he can hear directly from Senate Republicans, directly from Senate Republicans, why what he's proposing will not pass. So I invite him to come on up today and meet with Senate Republicans hear directly from them, and we can discuss what he has in mind. And we can start talking about, maybe, finally start talking about what's actually possible. The President says he wants to get working, wants us to get working. I can't think of a better way than to have him come right on over today, we're waiting, and hear directly from our conference about the legislative realities in Congress right now. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
We are. I'd ask unanimous consent that it be uh, dispensed with and also ask unanimous consent to enter into a uh, colloquy with my uh, Republican colleagues. Without objection. Mr. President, our nation has an over $14 trillion debt and faces permanent deficits unless we can get a handle on our finances. I've got a chart here which I think shows what uh, our future is going to look like if we stay on the current trajectory. As you can see, the path uh, leads us to higher and higher debt to GDP uh, levels that are unprecedented in American history. In fact, we're in unprecedented territory already. You have to go back to World War II to find a time when we had this kind of debt to GDP. As the chart shows, we're going to face an ever-increasing burden of debt, and without shoring up our finances, we know what our future is and what it's going to, going to look like in this country. Just this week, we saw uh, the country of Greece had to approve an austerity package to be eligible for their next disbursement of a multi-billion dollar bailout loan from the IMF and from other European countries. This austerity package included 28.4 billion euros in spending cuts and tax increases, and that's exactly what happens if we don't do anything. We're going to be faced at a time when we will be faced with massive cuts in spending, massive tax increases, uh, if we don't get our fiscal house in order. But that isn't necessary, Mr. President, because there is a better way to solve this problem. Instead of more debt and more spending, we could pass a balanced budget amendment that would prevent us from spending more than we take in. And we know what the effect of this is on our future as well. We have states all across this country, 49 states, that have some type of balanced budget requirement, including uh, my home state of South Dakota. It's a reason why uh, our state's budget is always balanced. Our legislature can't go home until that happens. We need that same sort of discipline here in Washington, D.C., and a balanced budget amendment would bring that. Uh, I have with me uh, on the floor a, a colleague uh, from, from the state of Nebraska, Senator Johans, who also served as his state's governor. And uh, I, I think, as I, my understanding is at least, uh, that the uh, senator from Nebraska, at, when he was governor, had a balanced budget requirement in their constitution. And I wonder if you could explain what effect that had on your state and whether it forced you to make some of the tough choices that are necessary to get uh, the budget balanced. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about uh, a topic that I think has made all the difference in the world for uh, my state, the state of Nebraska. I did have a, the privilege uh, a few years back of uh, serving as the governor of the state of Nebraska uh, until I came out uh, to join the uh, cabinet as Secretary of Agriculture. And I served uh, about six years. Um, before that, I was the mayor of our state capital, uh, the community of, of Lincoln, a great community. Um, and we followed the same pattern, really, at the governor's office that I did at the mayor's office. And we governed with a simple principle. We did not spend money that we did not have. Did not have. Now, before I talk about the balanced budget amendment, let me just explain to you how that worked as uh, mayor of Lincoln. Uh, my budget staff would go to work. They worked on the budget pretty much uh, year-round, really. It, it was a year-round endeavor. And at some point in the process, I would get a stack of paperwork that was about an inch thick with line after line after line after line of items that they were proposing that we needed to spend money on to keep the city running. And there would be everything from place cars to whatever to salaries and, I mean, imagine what it takes to run a city and it would be on that list and I would go through it item by item, page by page, studying each entry and ultimately reaching the conclusion for each entry, yes, I believe this is necessary to keep our city going. Well, somewhere in that thick stack of paperwork, I would turn over the page and I would come to a page where there was a red line drawn through the items. And the significance of that red line was that everything above that red line we had money for. Everything below that red line, there was no money for. And so if the next entry below the red line was something that I really wanted to see happen, then what I had to do as the chief executive of that community was to cut spending 
to eliminate something else. Because you see, when I went to the city council, I couldn't go to them and say, for operations, we're going to borrow a whole bunch of money. Well, it didn't really change at all when I became the governor of the state of Nebraska. Our constitution requires a balanced budget. And it's very, very straightforward. It just basically says you can't spend more than what's coming in. You can't buy things that you don't have money for. But let me add another piece to this that makes our state quite a bit different, I think, than virtually any other state in the United States. See, way back when, when our Constitution was written, those who sat down to write the Constitution with amazing foresight said, you know, at some point, politicians in their passion to get reelected are going to say to the people, you can have all of this and then finance it by borrowing money. Well, they didn't want that. And so literally there's a provision in the Constitution that in essence says you can't borrow any money. I think the limit is like $100,000, 50 or $100,000. And that's it. You know, if you drive across the roads in Nebraska, I want to point out to you that they're paid for. Why? Because we don't spend money we don't have. Our Constitution will not allow us to do it. And so, year after year, when we get together, we look at the priorities of the state. It might be education. It might be something relative to human services. It might be roads, whatever it is. And the executive branch, me as governor, working with the legislature, would decide what we are going to fund and at what level. And I could guarantee people of Nebraska that three things would happen by the end of the legislative session. Number one, a budget would be passed. Number two, it would be balanced. And number three, we would not borrow money for those first two things to happen. A budget would be passed and it would be balanced and we weren't going to borrow money to make that happen. And that's been going on for decades and decades and decades. Now, some are out there probably ready to rush down here to the floor and say, oh, Mike, that sounds so backward. And here's what I have to say. During this very difficult economic time, all of us agree it's been one of the toughest times since the Depression. Unemployment in Nebraska has not gone over 5%. Unemployment today in Nebraska is 4.1%. Let me say that a bit differently. 96% of people able to work in Nebraska have a job. 96%. Our legislature this year actually recessed early, and I believe I remember this correctly, they unanimously passed the state budget. Now, there's Democrats in the legislature, there's Republicans in the legislature, there's independents. How did they do that? They did that because they felt a responsibility to the state and to their constitution to get a budget done, to make sure it's balanced, and not to borrow money to get there. Now let me contrast that with what's happening out here. What's happening out here is for decades and decades and decades, we as the federal government have said to the people, don't you worry. We can be all things to all people. We can give you this. We can give you that. Because we've got a big credit card. 
Well, that credit card today is now at $14.5 trillion and growing, growing and growing and growing. And when I go back home and do town hall meetings and I look across the room and I see young people there or children, it pains me to tell them that I know who is going to be responsible to pay the credit card off. Not Mike Johans, who turned 61 this year, although it should be my responsibility, it's going to be our children and our grandchildren who have their own priorities, their own desires, their own wishes, and yet they're going to be saddled with trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of debt before they can even address their priorities. I'll end with this thought. What's the merit of a balanced budget amendment? Well, when I was 20 years old, our nation owed $380 billion. $380 billion. It is projected that when I reach 65, just four short years from now, our nation will owe $20 trillion. It is time to be honest with the American people. You won't solve this problem unless you put discipline in place like our states have done, like the great state of Nebraska has done that just essentially says year after year, president after president, senator after senator, house member after house member, you're going to have to live within your means. And that's what the balanced budget is about. Because you see, without that, there'll be always a way to get around it, to do something, and not accept the responsibility of running this country with fiscal responsibility. Well, I, I appreciate the, uh, the comments from uh, my colleague from Nebraska as a, an executive, both as a mayor and a governor, he obviously has had to make the hard decisions that are necessary to get the books to balance in his, uh, in both in the city of Lincoln and in the state of Nebraska. And uh, it strikes me that, uh, as you have observed, the economic circumstances in which the state of Nebraska finds itself today are, are so much better than other places around the country. And granted, there are lots of uh, factors that contribute to that. Part of it, I think, has to do with the, uh, you know, the, the, the business climate in, in some, some states around the country, but clearly uh, also a function of the discipline that the, um, the state of Nebraska imposes on itself through this uh, balanced budget amendment and the decisions that the leaders in that state, both uh, legislators and governor, uh, make in order to make that possible. And so uh, the, the, the senator from Nebraska's experience, I think, is very valuable in helping us shape the debate that ought to occur here on a balanced budget amendment. And I would say that one of the features of the balanced budget amendment that we're both co-sponsoring is that it caps spending at 18 percent of our entire economy. And, and that's not a number that's picked out of thin air. That's a number that comes from a historical level of taxation for the past uh, 40 years. And in the past, the past five times that the budget was balanced here in Washington, and, and bear in mind five times probably in the last 40 years, uh, spending averaged just under 18.7 percent of GDP, not too far off from what the balanced budget requirement that, that, that the cap that would be imposed under this amendment uh, would require. And further, we know that in 2007, a year in which uh, that we had tax laws that are very similar to current tax laws, revenue was 18.5 percent of GDP. So if we could constrain spending to 18 percent of our entire economic output, we'd be able to balance the budget without raising taxes. Now, our, our colleagues on the other side seem to think that, uh, continue to claim the problem could be fixed if we had only raised taxes on a few rich people, tax corporate jets, tax, uh, you know, stop giving tax breaks to American energy production, those sorts of things. The truth is that the tax proposals from Democrats put only a relatively minor debt in the deficit uh, to truly balance the budget through tax increases, you would have to see astronomical uh, rate increases that would hit not only high income earners and corporations, but middle class and small businesses as well. So this is clearly not what the American people want. It's not what I want. Simply raising taxes on job creators isn't going to improve our economy. It's only going to hurt it more. 
And uh, tax increases aren't the only threat to our economy. We also know that these current levels of debt are costing us about a million jobs a year as well, and that these debt levels are only predicted to increase. And I guess I would ask my colleague from Nebraska, in his experience as a governor, as a mayor, uh, whether or not when it came time to make these hard decisions about balancing the budget, uh, did the, the notion of, uh, of raising revenues, increasing taxes uh, come into play? Because I'm sure that was a debate that always was raised. It always is. You know, you can either reduce the, the amount of spending or you can raise taxes on someone. And uh, it strikes me the problem we have here in Washington is not uh, that we don't have enough revenue. Uh, we've got plenty of revenue. We've just got uh, too much spending. And I'm curious to know in the state of Nebraska if that was uh, what his experience was in terms of this debate that we have here about more taxes or less spending. We adopted the philosophy in the state of Nebraska that we wanted to be job creators. We wanted to have that low unemployment. And so we recognize that it's not government that's going to create the jobs. After all, people don't want a bigger, grander, greater state government or federal government for that matter. But our responsibility was to create the right climate so a small business had an opportunity to grow and expand. That a large employer looking across the United States for a great place to locate would know that they had an opportunity to grow and expand a business in the state of Nebraska. And so we fought like tooth and nail. And I'll give you a current example. If you dial the clock back to about uh, November of last year, you would see that our current governor, David Heinemann, <clears throat> was faced with a great challenge. He had about a billion dollars that he had to somehow make up to balance the budget over a two-year cycle. Now, for a state night like Nebraska, that is a powerful amount of money. You know, in Washington, where we talk about trillion-dollar programs like stimulus, et cetera, that may not sound like much, but it's a huge amount of money in our state. Now, I suppose uh, our governor could have said, well, if we uh, just hit the taxpayer here more and hit the taxpayer there more, then all of this will balance out. But he adopted very much the opposite view, which is exactly what I expect of Gover Governor Heinemann. And he said, we're going to balance the budget and we're going to do it without raising taxes. And you know, when you think about it, that philosophy is absolutely right. You know, families are tightening their belt. They're balancing their budget. They're doing everything they can. They're suffering through economic times that are tough. Why would you hit them harder? Why would you go to your families who are already struggling and saying, I got to take more money out of your billfold and send it to the state capitol? And so he led and he stepped forward and he said, here's a plan to deliver a balanced budget. And you know what? He didn't send somebody else to go into that room. He went to himself and said, this is a plan that I believe in for the future of our state. And he was there through every minute, every hour, every second of the legislative session. And at the end of it, with no tax increases, they balanced the budget. And like I said, I have to check this, but if memory serves me correctly, I think that plan passed unanimously. And in our state legislature, we have members who are more liberal than others, more conservative. We have some who are Democrats, some who are Republicans. But you know what our chief executive led? And again, I draw sharp contrast here. There is one nationally elected official in our nation, and we call him Mr. President. The president pays the filing fee and convinces the nation that he or she is the right person to occupy that office, and there is no substitute for their leadership. We need to have our chief executive, the man we call Mr. President, deliver a plan that he believes is the right direction for our country. And 
that is the key to this issue. Now, I will be very clear. I like the plan of a Governor Heinemann. In tough times, you pull back. When the revenues are a little bit better, you can do some things and establish some new priorities. But what happens out here is there is no prioritization. It's just spend on everything. Spend on everything that walks by. And someday, our kids and grandkids are going to have to pay off the credit card. And I just don't think that's right. I thank the, the Senator from Nebraska for his observations about that. And I see our, in just a minute here, I want to turn to the, uh, the ranking uh, member of the Senate Budget Committee to talk about setting priorities, because that's something we're not doing here. I do want to point out in the course of this discussion, however, that uh, what you have said is exactly right. You cut spending and you, you grow the economy. One of the things you need to do is you've got to create jobs, you've got to get economic expansion going. The way not to do that is to raise taxes. And that's the prescription that many of our colleagues on the other side would like is, well, let's just get more revenue, we'll raise taxes. That is the acts, absolutely the opposite thing that you would do when you've got a down economy and you're trying to create jobs. And so what we ought to be looking at is how do we reduce the size of government, get, it, get us living within our means, and, and getting the economy growing and expanding again and creating jobs. I want to point out one thing, though. This is important in, in my view because we've all, we're, we're, we're planning right now to the extent that there's any planning going on here. And unfortunately, without a budget, it's very difficult to prioritize. But there are expectations about revenue, what revenues are going to be for the foreseeable future. There was an interesting piece earlier this week in the Wall Street Journal, an op-ed piece written by Larry Lindsay, who is a former economic advisor to President Bush and also former Federal Reserve governor, who pointed out that the current predictions for debts and deficits in the, very coming, in the coming years are very, very optimistic for a couple of reasons. One is that the uh, White House and the CBO are using very optimistic numbers for growth in our economy. And uh, while I hope that they're correct, I am concerned that they could be very much overstating the potential uh, for growth in our economy. If more realistic numbers were used, uh, what Larry Lindsay recognized in that story was that the impact of the financial crisis on our economy, our debt numbers could jump by an additional $4 trillion over the next 10 years by assuming a more uh, historic growth level uh, given the, the times that we've been through. The, at the same time, um, you know, the president and the CBO are also predicting that interest rates are going to remain much lower than they have historically. And what uh, Mr. Lindsay pointed out in this uh, op-ed was that if interest rates normalize, in other words, reset to what are the historical averages, it would cost us an additional $4.9 trillion over the next 10 years to more to, uh, to finance our debt than what we're currently expecting. So those two factors alone would have an $8.9 trillion negative impact on these forecasts for the next decade. And so again, points to the importance of getting spending under control and doing it now. He finally pointed out that the new health care law is another significant hidden cost. And that if you look at what employers are uh, increasingly being faced with, many of them are going to choose to dump their employees into these public exchanges, and that you're going to see the additional cost of about, it's anywhere from about 74 to $85 billion a year uh, over the next 10 years. So you start adding that up, you add in the, uh, the, uh, the economic growth assumptions, assuming that they, um, and again, I hope that, that they are right, but assuming that they are wrong and that you have lower levels of economic growth, what I think are probably more realistic levels, if you have more realistic interest rates, uh, at least in terms of historical averages, these uh, long-term predictions are just get awful in a real hurry. And uh, the nice thing about having a balanced budget amendment is you are forced to make those decisions every year. Instead of, you know, dealing with these long-term predictions, which are often inaccurate, each and every year the budget has to be balanced. So if interest rates go up, the budget's got to be balanced. If employers put their employees on the exchanges, the budget's got to be balanced. If there are fictional savings from these uh, independent payment advisory boards that are being created and those aren't realized, the budget's got to be balanced. If taxes don't produce as much revenue as predicted, the budget's got to be balanced. I mean, this is, this is the, the very simple solution that, as the senator from Nebraska pointed out, so many states have come to, so many states have concluded that uh, you've got to have some sort of a requirement to balance the budget. It's the most powerful fiscal reform that we could ever have here in Washington, D.C. We've got credit agencies that are questioning our long-term budget outlook. Um, if we did a balanced budget amendment, I think that they would be, there, would, there wouldn't be any question 
that our country would be able to pay all of our bills. Now, I was a member of the House of Representatives back in 1997. I think the senator from Alabama was here at the time. There was a vote on a balanced budget amendment at that time. And uh, we didn't vote on it in the House because the Senate voted on it first. The Senate came within one vote, one single vote, of passing a balanced budget amendment. Had they done that, we would have been able to pass it in the House. We had the votes for it. We could have sent it on to the states. And I can't help but thinking how different our fiscal situation would be today if they'd had that one additional vote back in 1997 to get us a balanced budget amendment. Now, many of our colleagues here campaigned on a balanced budget amendment, but the, uh, you know, hopefully when we get a chance to vote on it, and I hope we do here in the next few weeks, we'll see uh, whether or not the, uh, the, the rhetoric matches up uh, with the actions here. But all that to say, uh, we've got a major, major fiscal challenge facing this country for all the, the, the reasons the senator from Nebraska noted. We are handing our children a burden of debt that is not fair to them, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, we have got to bring some discipline to the process of budgeting around here. And what's unfortunate, and this is why I want to turn to our colleague from Alabama, because he is the ranking member on the Senate Budget Committee, we have done nothing in 792 days to prioritize spending. This federal government spends $3.7 trillion annually of the taxpayers' money, and we have not passed a budget for 792 days, let alone one that actually balances. And so, you know, my state of South Dakota spends annually about $3 billion. This federal government borrows $4 billion every single day. The borrowing of the federal government exceeds in one day what the state of South Dakota spends in an entire year. That is the dimension of the problem that we are dealing with. All that being said, it's been 792 days since we uh, produced a budget here in the United States Senate. And so I would say to my uh, colleague from Alabama, um, clearly this is, <laughs> this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Wouldn't you say that this is reflective of the lack of political courage, the lack of political will, the lack of discipline around here? We've got colleagues on the other side who say we don't need a balanced budget amendment. That's a gimmick. All we've got to do is balance the budget. Well, where is it? Where is the budget? And where is the budget that's supposed to balance? Uh, it's, it's, it's not happening. And so I think the balanced budget amendment is a simple, straightforward way in which to deal uh, with a massive, massive challenge facing us in the future. And, it's, and we need some discipline imposed upon uh, federal spending on the Congress that so many states have. And as the senator from Nebraska pointed out, as a governor of his state, he was able to exercise. And so I would uh, refer to my colleague from Alabama, just to ask him his thoughts about uh, where we are with regard to the budget and is our lack of discipline here um, you know, not, I should say, is our lack of a willingness to pass a budget not a, a reflection of the lack of discipline that exists in the Congress today and an unwillingness to make the hard choices that are necessary to get this fiscal, this fiscal train back on track? Thank you, Senator Thune. Um, uh, thank you so much for your comments and that of Senator Johans. Uh, you're raising a fundamental question. We've never, ever been in a financial situation in our country that's systemically, deeply dangerous as we are today. You go through a war, you borrow a lot of money. You go through a recession, maybe your debt goes up some. But we're systemically in a recession, but we're also in a, in a long-term projections of a dangerous levels of debt surging as your chart shows. So last year, uh, the Democratic majority moved a budget out of committee. Senator Thune's a member of that budget committee uh, and un remembers that debate. Senator Reid declared that he wasn't going to bring it up. It was never brought up on the floor of the Senate and even debated. This year, apparently the majority leader decided once again we would not have a budget and directed that the budget committee not even mark up a budget. So we've not even commenced work on a budget this year. Indeed, the majority leader said it was foolish for the country to have a, uh, uh, a budget this year, which is stunning since, since during the 792 days we've been without a budget, the debt of the United States has increased some $2 trillion. That's a stunning, stunning thing. So yes, I believe that history shows in the past and the 
based on the real crisis we face in the future, there's never been a more important time for us to do what so many states do, have a, a, a balanced budget amendment that requires us each year to balance that budget. I, I really believe this is the right thing for us, and it would be so much better for our country. Senator Johan is here, and he talked about executive leadership. Uh, you and Senator Thune were talking about uh, just how dangerous the debt path we we're on is, how much greater it was in Nebraska's situation. Alabama's had to cut uh, spending. We're not cutting spending at all, haven't been. We've been increasing spending here. But I guess I wanted to ask you a, a really serious question. Do you feel like the first responsibility of the chief executive of the United States, the president, would be to honestly tell the American people that this is not just a political dust-up, but that we are facing a very serious debt crisis that could actually uh, uh, put us into an economic tailspin again, knock us down again, and uh, the debt numbers we're seeing would look even worse. Do you feel like he has that responsibility, and do you feel like it's been met? Uh, Senator Sessions raises an excellent point. Um, having really served in the executive branch pretty much exclusively until I came to the Senate two years ago, uh, there is only one leader. And I not only believe that the executive, in this case the President of the United States, has that responsibility, but I feel very, very strongly that that responsibility has not been discharged. Um, I fully appreciate the need to go out there and drive a message and get votes and get yourself elected or reelected. Uh, that, of course, is what democracy is all about. But there is a point at which uh, the election is over and that needs to be set aside. And there needs to be someone who can lead on behalf of the entire United States. We are all United States senators. But it is the people of Nebraska who vote for me. We only have one nationally elected official, and that is the gentleman that I referred to previously was called Mr. President. There is no substitute for that, not in our system of government. It is absolutely incumbent upon the President to lay out in terms that the United States citizens can understand what we are facing. I'll just be very candid. I could not be more disappointed with the President's comments yesterday. And it's his podium. He's free to talk about whatever he chooses to talk about, and he doesn't need the advice of Mike Johans. But I will tell you what a great opportunity that was to talk about the dire situation of our budget and to lay out in stark detail what brings us to this situation and invite the American people to understand the difficulty we are facing and most importantly, to put a plan out that the President stands behind. Now, let me tell you what happened this year. The President put out a plan. The plan came to the floor of the Senate and it was so disregarded, it did not get a single vote wasn't a serious plan. No one took it as a serious plan. Now, think about that. No Republican, no Democrat, no Independent, no Liberal, no Conservative, no Moderate said this is the right plan for the future of this great nation. Not a single one in this United States Senate. That's a very, very serious situation for our nation. It is time to be serious about this and to present a serious proposal that makes the hard choices. Don't tell me that you can solve this problem by 
well, everybody's going to pay higher taxes. That makes over a certain level. I did the math on that. When I first heard that, I said, okay, let me understand that better. If you earn over $250,000 a year, what would the tax rate have to be for those earners just to balance the budget for that year? I'm not talking about the massive amount of debt that lies in front of our children and grandchildren, just to balance the budget that year. The tax rate, 90 percent. And it has gotten worse because our deficit has grown to $1.6 trillion. Ninety percent, and actually I think if I redid that mass, math, it would be closer to 100 percent. Well, that may be a great political talking point. It may be tested. It may be polled. It may be a 70 percent talking point. It may be an 80 percent talking point. But I tell you what, it isn't going to solve the problem that this nation faces. It just simply isn't. It just isn't the pathway that deals with the massive problem that we have. And there's no one else who can speak to the nation like the President of the United States. Senator Sessions can't. Senator Johans can't. Senator McConnell and Senator Reid, with all of their stature, cannot either. That bully puppet is unique to the President of the United States. And we have yet to see that responsibility met. I, I think that 